It's my pleasure to welcome you to the Clark Howard Show, where our mission is to serve you and empower you so you make better financial decisions in your life. So I answer as many questions as I can on our podcast, but I can't get to even a tiny fraction of those that are sent in. And that's why for 30 plus years, we've had the Team Clark Consumer Action Center providing free one-on-one advice, guidance, and information. Available Monday through Friday, six hours each day, Eastern time zone, 10 in the morning till four in the afternoon. The number, 636-49-CLARK. In today's episode, when prices went just through the roof over the last few years, lots of people bought high and are now in over their heads in vehicle loans. And what do you need to know about the problems in the vehicle market and how those problems can become your problem? We're going to talk about that. And later, there's been such a shift. Okay, you buy a piece of electronics equipment and you own it and you use it. And then one day it goes down dead on you. Not the guts of it. It's still powering up. It still would work fine, but it no longer works. We are now being married to the companies we buy so many electronic gadgets from after the sale, just like we were when we bought the item. Now, I want to tell you what you need to be aware of that can burn your wallet. Speaking of burning your wallet, Late pays on auto loans are going up, 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 and away. And this is something that was so obvious that it was not exactly brilliant that I predicted two years ago this was going to happen. I knew it was going to happen because when the prices of used vehicles inflated 70%, And they've now come down a fair amount. And there was such a shortage of new vehicles that dealers were selling them way above manufacturer's suggested retail price. It caused a twofer problem. First, people were paying far more than what vehicles were ultimately going to be worth. New ones a couple of years out. Used ones uh, almost immediately because you were paying so much more than those vehicles had been worth because of the shortages. I'm not getting get into all the chip shortages and supply chain problems and the car rental companies and the used vehicle market distorting everything, blah, 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 blah. What happened was it caused a double problem. You were having to pay far more for a vehicle than would be normal. And then that pushed you to take out an ultra long-term loan on something that was rapidly depreciating. So any hiccup in your life, bam, medical problem, job loss, you have to relocate, uh, family thing like a couple splitting, a divorce, whatever, and the finances crash and the vehicle loan you're stuck with because the vehicle's now way upside down where the loan has a much higher remaining balance than what the vehicle's now worth. I mean, train wrecked city. So, I mean, it was not brilliant to know this was happening, and now it is happening. So if you're in the situation where you're wheezing with that vehicle, if you can do anything you can to avoid going into a repossession mode on that vehicle, please keep paying it. Please, if you can, keep paying it. Because a repossession is the worst of all possible situations. Forget how it trashes your credit. The real problem is that when a vehicle is repoed, it ends up being disposed of by the lender way below wholesale value then the lender has what's called recourse against you. They can then sue you, and they will successfully get a judgment in most cases 
in states where this is permitted, deficiency judgments, and you will not have the vehicle to drive anymore, and you will still owe on the vehicle and have to pay for it at an incredibly ridiculous amount because they will have sold it low below wholesale, and you're responsible for all that gap between what remains on the loan balance, plus the fees they're allowed to charge you because they had to do a repo, plus the really low dollar amount they got for it, disposing of it. So if at all possible, and if, if I'm uh, dancing past the graveyard, your finance is too far gone, you can't do this, I get it. But if you're like, you know, I don't like this vehicle, it's costing me too much, I think I'm just going to let the lender have it back. Uh-uh. If it's, if it's a choice you're making because you're pressed versus something where you've got no other option left other than to have the repo, if it is at any level a choice, please keep those payments going. Now, let's fast forward to today. Used vehicle prices have come down, but they're still elevated from where they were. New vehicle prices have been trending down. They're still really expensive both. So as I've said so many different ways to so many different questions, if you're thinking of buying a new to you vehicle or a brand new vehicle and the current one you have is working fine, keep driving the one you've got for now. Give it some time. The vehicle market is healing. Give it more time. And you may not live by, but please remember my 42-month rule, which is this simple. If you cannot afford the monthly payment on a vehicle you want to buy, new or used, with what the payment would be on a 42-month cycle, you cannot afford that vehicle, period. Krista? YJ in California says on a recent podcast episode, Clark talked about how now's the best time to buy mattresses. One advantage of the old way of purchasing a mattress is that the deliverer would haul away the old mattress for free or for a small fee. With the new mattress in a box delivery model, what's the best way to get rid of my old mattresses so I don't have to spend a fortune just to dispose of them? So the key, YJ, is when it's dark outside, you haul it out and throw it in a vacant lot. No. <laughs> Too many people do that. I was just kidding. Um, you said something really important, and that's that you live in California. And under California law, the seller has to haul away your old mattress. So if you buy an online mattress, the seller may not even be aware that under California law, they have to come get your old mattress. Or they may know, and they don't volunteer that. You've got to make sure you let them know that they've got to come get it and dispose of it to prevent the first thing I said about people just dumping them somewhere. Um, in many jurisdictions around the country, outside of California, there are what are called, uh, many places are called solid waste days or something like that. There's usually a day or two a month in many jurisdictions where you're allowed to take something big and bulky or bulk disposal day or whatever they call it and put it out on the curb and your local uh, trash hauling service will haul it away. They may charge you a fee to do so, but usually the fee will not be extraordinary, extraordinarily large. There are some charities, depending on the laws of the state, that will come and get your old mattresses for you, and then they use a recovering service to put a new cover on them, and then they either give them to people who, who um, need a bed, or they sell them at very low prices. So any of those things might work. Um, check out, there's a website, buybuymattress.com, and they have a section called Retailer Take Back. And you'll be able to see how you might be able to get rid of them. And Bye Bye is B-Y-E, B-Y-E, mattress.com. And then click on the Retailer Take Back section. Well, they also have a whole, they, this website is dedicated to the mattresses not ending up in landfills so that you can look by every single state and see at least where you could bring a mattress or dispose of it. So it is a pretty good website. Okay. Scott in North Dakota says I'm the treasury secretary, the secretary treasurer for a small nonprofit association. 
We want to put $25,000 into a high interest savings account as a treasury reserve to use only in case of unexpected expenses. All of the high interest rate online accounts that I've found are only for personal accounts and won't accept an application using a federal EIN tax identification number instead of a social security number. What is the best high interest rate account for a nonprofit association? Our tax status is that we are 501c3 and we are not required to file tax returns because our annual income is always less than $50,000, actually much less. So Scott, um, I don't know uh, what part of North Dakota you live in, but if you're in Eastern North Dakota, you will have access to physical offices of Schwab and Fidelity. So many nonprofit organizations uh, open what's referred to, I think they're called organization accounts. There's some term like that they use at Fidelity and Schwab. And you can put the money into a um, treasury money market fund, uh, which is back, you know, owning U.S. treasuries, which is the actual federal government or government obligation uh, money market funds. I talked about these just recently mm -hmm. for just regular normal earthlings to know is a great way to stash money, typically earning upper threes to upper four percent, depending on which account you go into. Uh, as a uh, nonprofit association, you probably are not supposed to put it into a general money market fund with either of them. But going into a uh, government obligation fund or a U.S. Treasury fund, these accounts have no cost to open, and you're able to earn this interest. Now, uh, most organizations are eligible for these accounts at Schwab and Fidelity. Uh, there may be a reason that the way you were set up as a 501c3 would prevent it. Don't know, but that's why if you have a Schwab or Fidelity branch near where you are in North Dakota, I would go to it and see if you can open an organization account with them. Annette in Alabama says, what's the deal with the high cost of all-in-one desktop computers? When did desktops become popular again? So it's funny you ask the question that way because almost all computers sold now are laptops. And the all-in-ones fill a niche in the marketplace. The volume is not very high. And so because it is not a high production part of the market and is considered to be a specialty item, the prices are ridiculous. I've seen them, how expensive the all-in-ones are. So the idea is you don't have one of those towers to, you know, that you're kicking with your shin underneath your desk. And um, it's really, you don't have to lug it all around. You just pick up the all-in-one, take it somewhere else in the house. So the alternative that I've recommended is that you have a monitor and a mouse and if you want a keyboard, and you just hook it into your laptop. Or if you happen to use Samsung phones, a Samsung phone can power um, basically a computer for you. It's, you know These smartphones have really powerful computers in them. And you can just plug your Samsung phone into basically a, a monitor, keyboard, and mouse. So there are alternatives. Because, yes, the all-in-ones are sleek. They are convenient for having a desktop kind of thing. But if you think about it, you just go buy a monitor, how inexpensive they are to buy a computer monitor. It can be a nice, big, easy-on-your-eyes screen. You can buy keyboards for as little as $9. You can buy a nice one, I guess, probably for 20 You can buy all different kinds of mice to go into, uh, into the laptop and operate that way as an alternative other than the all-in-one. And the easiest way to do it is you can just buy a little device. They used to be called docking, docking stations, station. but a little device that has a USB that plugs into your laptop, and all the other devices just plug into that. So and those are very inexpensive it. now. Oh, absolutely. Where the docking stations at one time were a corporate environment thing, and so you had to pay about the national debt of Botswana <laughs> to buy one before. Soon as something becomes a corporate item, the price of it goes crazy. Now this is a consumer item, so it's not expensive anymore. Uh, coming ahead, electronics that are working just fine, 
but will no longer work for the function you bought them for, this is getting to be a bigger and bigger problem for people, and we're going to talk about it. At a house I used to own, we had Arlo cameras, A-R-L-O, and they're really nice cameras. They give really good video quality. And uh, the poor people who bought our house, we sold them a house with all the Arlos in place. We moved the username and password to the new owners and all that. And now their cameras are dead, or were going to be, because Arlo decided, you know what, we're not going to support these anymore. Because I had the Arlos where you got the free storage and so Arlo only made the money for selling the original cameras. And then, you know, the storage, they want to make money ongoing subscription. But when I bought them, you got the free storage. So Arlo, after they did this, there was a firestorm. And there was a lot of media coverage. And the Wall Street Journal tech writer wrote a story about it because it moved from the, the tech blogs to the mainstream media, and now, well, they've decided, Arlo, okay, okay, we're going to change our minds, and we're going to keep supporting them. But I felt bad because I bragged to the buyers of the house, you know, you don't have to pay to monitor these cameras. And then suddenly they were going to have to, and now they have a stay of execution of their wallets. But this is... A real thing is that more and more electronics require that you be the prisoner of whatever company whose electronics you buy. That the device only continues to work if you pay an ongoing subscription. And you may have heard me talk about the ring I wear. So I used to wear a wedding band that I got at Walmart for $11. And I thought it was a really nice wedding band. And then uh, three years ago, approximately, I decided to get the Aura ring, O-U-R-A ring. And the Aura ring is a health tracker, does fitness too, but it's really about um, gauging your health. And I had a bad virus recently, and it's fascinating looking at the Aura health measurements every day through my illness. And you could see as I first got sick and it was like this slope down and it went pretty straight down. Then it stayed in the sub-basement for three days and then the numbers started coming up. And the aura started getting better before I realized that I was better. Um, but it really does an incredible job tracking my health, my sleep, and my activity, my fitness. Well, Aura, I bought the ring, and that was it. And you had use of all the software. Well, guess what they did? They don't do that anymore. They've decided that the ring is only useful if they can get in your wallet every month. So I'm grandfathered in, but people buying one now have to pay all the fees ongoing. And so everybody's into this subscription thing. But I think it's really crazy that you buy electronics and you own them, but you have to then continue to pay to use them. Do you know where that started? Okay, I'm going to take you in the Wayback Machine. Dun, dun, dun. The first company to come up with this diabolical idea was TiVo. Anybody remember TiVo from long ago? How, how long ago was that, Krista? Like seven years I'll ago? I'll have to look, yeah. Uh, Seems uh, like forever. TiVo, yeah, in, in electronics. electronics time, that's yeah. like That's like back uh, dinosaur days. So TiVo was a, uh, a digital video recorder, something that now is like, yeah, so what? Uh, that, but it was a revolutionary thing when it came out. And TiVo... You bought the machine, and then you had to pay the ongoing subscription to have the recordings of what you wanted to watch at a future date available to you. And they started 
a really bad trend in electronics. I don't know anybody had ever thought of something so terrible before TiVo did. And so what year did TiVo It was start? introduced in 99. 99, but really the last few years has not been a, a no, factor. No, not at all. And I don't think TiVo, when it started then, because I had one called Replay TV, which was kind of like, that was like Betamax and mm-hmm. and uh, what was the other one called? Video cassette. I don't remember. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Anyway, I picked the the one that didn't succeed, but I loved my Replay TV. And that one, there was no fee. Maybe that's why they didn't succeed. So this is something, anytime you buy electronics, know that if you're dependent on them to service it like an Arlo camera or something like that, where you can't do it on your own where you are, know that that device you've already paid for could be a doorstop someday. Now, there are, in the case of digital cameras for your home or office, there are those that have, uh, some of them have on-site media that you can put in. uh, Remember those things called SD cards? And micro SD, they still exist. And you can, with some of the cameras, you don't need off-site storage. You can put in an SD card and store an enormous amount of video on them. And then they write over themselves after a certain period of time. And avoid paying monthly fees. But the monthly fee thing, it is all the rage with electronics. And just remember, you're not just buying the device you're having to pay for it over time. I wear a Samsung watch, and I got a thing from my cell phone provider saying, they'll give me the new one for free, but I have to sign up for a watch line that will end up costing me $180 a year. Ain't doing it. Okay, we'll go to questions now. This is from Denise in Oregon. I've been going down the rabbit hole of stacking. This term stacking is new to me. It refers to buying precious metals, bullion, gold, and silver coins. I must admit I'm slightly influenced by the idea that a gold or silver coin would be more valuable than fiat currency, another new term I'm hearing about. Clark, just even attempting to write out a coherent question here has already been helpful. I can hear your voice bringing out, stop, don't fall for the trap. Am I hearing you correctly? Well, uh, pretty much. I don't have a problem with people buying commodities of various types, but they should only be a part of what you do. And I have a big bias towards commodity funds. If you buy actual precious metals of various types, you are paying enormous buy sell fees you know there's a spread in the buy sell and you're not getting good value for your money because you have to overcome the spread that you have on the buy and the spread you have on the sell and there are people who get very unhappy with me when i talk about well just buy a gold fund a silver fund or a precious metals fund a precious metals fund would likely be most suitable for this whole stacking thing you're hearing about But what it does is it provides what's known as a hedge. What any of these precious metals are about is they are like a little insurance policy or a hedge for bad times. I believe that regardless of what difficulties we face over time, the only thing that's the end of the world is the end of the world. We as humans adapt, we overcome, and we've shown that through human history. So I... I am not a, into this myself, but if it is something you like, I like for you to look at buying a gold fund or a precious metals fund with no more than 10% of your investable assets. The rest should be invested in productive activities that can generate wealth for you over time, i.e., um, you hear me talk about index funds, stock funds, exchange-traded funds, and by the way, exchange-traded funds that's the area or um, a mutual fund where you should own precious metals or gold most effectively. And uh, I think we have information on Clark.com about doing just that. Yes. This is from Mary in South Carolina. What's the best kind of life insurance for my mortgage? If my spouse passes, it would pay off my home. Mary, uh, first of all, good job planning for the possibility 
of the tragic loss of a loved one. The insurance, the um, bank, the mortgage company will deluge you with paperwork for a horrible insurance product called mortgage life insurance. It is what they call croak insurance, and it names the bank as the beneficiary of the policy, not you. The premiums generally 10 times market price to insure you or your spouse. What's a better idea and gives you much more flexibility if you and your spouse are both uh, healthy enough to underwrite is buy level term insurance policies for uh, 20, 30 years. You'll have the same premium all the time. The other person's the beneficiary of that policy, so your survivor is well taken care of, and they may decide that they want to uh, use it for the mortgage, or they may have another purpose to use that. But mortgage life insurance is a complete ripoff, and the only time you would ever consider it is if you have a pre-existing medical condition that makes it impossible for you to underwrite for actual good insurance. We have two things for you at Clark.com in this area. One, an explanation about why you never buy croak insurance from a bank. And number two, and that's really how they talk about us, croak. Um, Number two is we have a guide to how to buy level term insurance, which is what you actually want to have. And you should both have it, not just one of you. From Phil in Georgia, I'm currently on my parents' teacher health insurance, which has been great because it's free for them to keep me on, even though I'm now 24. However, my father's retiring at the end of the year, and I will no longer be able to. So what's the best health insurance for someone who is self-employed and who has not been to the doctor in years? So, Phil, if you, uh, depending on your income, you may qualify for a very large subsidy at healthcare.gov which is the federal insurance exchange. There's a special law that gives very large subsidies on the purchase of individual or family health insurance through, I think, 25. And so that would be where you start at healthcare.gov. If your state has has its own exchange, you would go there. And in fact, if you go to healthcare.gov, they ask your zip code, and they will take you to the state exchange if it's not a federal exchange state. But the procedure would be the same. You would see your eligibility for a policy. Now, if you uh, are able to get one at a very low premium, that solves the problem. You have full coverage without exclusions, but you do have high deductibles with these plans. Speaking of which, as someone who's 24, never really goes to the doctor, you can look at a plan on healthcare.gov or the state equivalent exchange that would be a catastrophic plan. It wouldn't pay for routine stuff. It only would pay in the event there was a catastrophe. And so that's what I would look at first. You don't have to buy on the exchange. You can buy what's known as a temporary health policy that doesn't do a whole lot for you, but has very low premiums if you don't qualify for one of the low premium policies on healthcare.gov and you don't want to spend the big bucks you would have to pay without the subsidy that's being supplied right now. So um, you got some homework to do and many people have been able to stay on their family, their parents' health insurance till their 26th birthday and that was a change that Congress made Gosh, I feel like that was uh, back about 2010, and that has changed the equation on young adults having to get their own health coverage in so many cases, and you're just losing that because of retirement a little early, your dad's retirement. And thank you so much for being with us today. Know that we are, as I alluded to Clark.com just moments ago, we are here to serve you around the clock with information you can trust for your wallet at Clark.com, and for the best deals for your wallet each and every day, check out Clark Deals. Have a great day.